is St Andrews, South Brisbane. Please turn to Psalm 122, which is on page 616 in the Church Bibles. You'll see that the psalm is headed, A Song of Ascents of David. The psalms were meant to be sung. The Psalter was the Old Testament's hymn book. And Psalm 122, as with many others, was written by David, Israel's first king, who was a musician. He played the harp. The songs of ascents were sung by Jewish pilgrims as they approached the city of Jerusalem. We may think of ascents in the same way that it's conventional to say one goes up to London and conversely down from it. David sang, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Perhaps you know this in the Coverdale Psalter version from the Book of Common Prayer. I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord. The most famous setting of this is by Sir Hubert Parry, which is sung at coronations. Listen out for it next year. But there's a problem. What is meant by the house of the Lord? An obvious answer is the Jewish temple, except in David's day, the temple had yet to be built. Sure, David had gathered the building materials, but it was his son Solomon who put them together, or rather, he got others to do this for him. So, what does David mean? To what is he referring? We have hymns that refer to Jerusalem or Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the golden, glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. And of course, there's the hymn, Jerusalem sung to a tune that's also by Hubert Parry. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in this our green and pleasant land. None of these hymns is referring to the actual city of Jerusalem located in Israel, or at least they're not doing so in a literal sense. For them, Jerusalem has a spiritual meaning that reaches far beyond the walls of the ancient city of Jerusalem and also is a vision of what is yet to come. In Revelation 21, John writes, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. That's where, if you're Christian, you'll be spending eternity. And that's what each of those hymns is referring to. That's what Jerusalem signifies for us. And the city of Jerusalem served a similar purpose for David. Instead of the house of the Lord, perhaps it's better to think in terms of household, the place where God's people dwell. That's what the city of Jerusalem was in David's day, and that's what the new Jerusalem will be for us after Jesus' return. Verse 3. Jerusalem is built like a city but is closely compacted together. I have a small flat in the old town of Rothine in Croatia. And let me tell you, the old town, Starigrad, is closely 
compacted together. Indeed, the street my flat is on is called Uski Prolaz, which means narrow passage. But the advantage of such construction is strength and unity that leads to the 12 tribes of Israel going up to the city together, verse 4. And our vision, to which David is also pointing, is of people from every tribe on earth being united through praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. There was no such throne in Jerusalem in David's day. But for him, Jerusalem the Golden correctly interprets this as a feature of the new Jerusalem. There is the throne of David. Revelation 21.5, John's vision again. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And the one who is seated on the throne is Jesus, great David's greater son. You may hear people say how we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And it's true that that disputed city is in need of prayer for peace now as much as ever. And we should bear in mind that its very name, Jerusalem, means city of peace. Yet the invocation, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, has a wider and deeper application. Other translations I've come across include ask for the peace of Jerusalem and invoke the peace of Jerusalem. It's a similar sentiment to when we pray to our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Albert Barnes' commentary says this of pray for the peace of Jerusalem. To us now, it inculcates the duty of praying for the church, its peace, its unity, its prosperity, its increase, its influence on our country and on the world at large. It is a prayer that the church may not be divided by schism or heresy, but its members may cherish for each other right feelings that there may be no jealousies, no envyings, and no jars, that the different branches of a church may regard and treat each other with kindness, with respect, and with mutual recognition, that prosperity may attend them all. Given this association of Jerusalem with the church, it is interesting what David goes on to say at the beginning of verse 8, for the sake of my family and friends. How tempting it can be to think that my religion is my business, something we do apart from those we're usually with. He's got his interests, I've got mine. But the church is there, for the sake of my family and friends. The idea is that your family and friends should be here with you. Have you invited them? Perhaps Christmas provides an opportunity. We usually go to church at Christmas. You'd be welcome to join us. When visiting my sister's family at Christmas, I'd go to church alone. But looking back, I don't think I ever asked if they'd like to come with me. In the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, we read, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to God, 
the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood. The question is, have you done so? I hope you have. Whatever your spiritual need or category, however you or I might describe it, this passage about Mount Zion can include us, it can include you. If you want to come to the city of God, you can. You just have to trust in Jesus to accept what he did for you on the cross, where his blood was shed for your sin, to be willing to make him Lord of your life from now on. To come to Jesus in that way is to come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. I've been to the Holy Land once in 2007. I landed at Tel Aviv Airport at four in the morning. I'd meant to ask for my passport not to be stamped, but I was only half awake, and before I knew it, I heard the thud of the stamp. When I arrive at the heavenly Jerusalem in the next life, there'll be no need for such a stamp, no need for a visa valid for only so many days. For I will arrive as a citizen. One time arriving at Sydney, I was pulled out of the queue so that their new X-ray machine could be tested on my luggage. But when the official saw my passport, his comment was, sorry mate, I didn't realize you were one of ours. That's what it will be like on arrival at the heavenly Jerusalem. There'll be a big sign saying, welcome home. I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord. Amen.